Hello, friends. It is so good to be together again. And I look at your names as they appear on the screen as you enter our Zoom room. Your names look so exotic and romantic to me, and I would mispronounce them, I think, if I tried. But I've been asking God to bless each one of you from head to toe. Let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, we love the stories about that brief period of time when you were on earth as a member of our race. What a lot you accomplished in that brief period of time. What a terrible sacrifice you made. What a wondrous victory you won. Will you please send your Holy Spirit to us now so that as we consider just one of those stories, we will be led into truth. Amen. Well, let's hear the wonderful story of the healing of the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. It's in John 5, 1 through 18. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic, Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was a Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to, di to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. May God add his blessing to the reading of that wonderful story. And now I'd like to talk about it a bit. Do you ever make a to-do list? I make out a to-do list just about every day and I find it very helpful. But I think that probably Jesus didn't write out a to-do list. I have three reasons for thinking that. The first reason is that back in first century Palestine, there wasn't paper. 
people could write on little broken pieces of pottery, you know, they could scratch on that, but they didn't have pa tablets of paper as we do. So that's my first reason for thinking that Jesus never wrote out a to-do list, no paper. I'll tell you the second reason in just a moment, but first I want to make it clear that even though Jesus probably didn't write out a to-do list, he did have things to do and he got them done. Every day, the unwritten and overarching theme or task of Jesus' to-do list was just one thing and it was the same thing every day, reveal the Father. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus said something that sounds to me like a person who has made a to-do list and is honestly, you know, taking stock and checking off the tasks. Uh, here's what Jesus said. It's in John 17, 4 and 6. Father, I have brought you glory by completing the work you gave me to do. I have revealed you. See? Every day, Jesus would reveal the Father. Or we could put it this way. Every day, Jesus would break some of Satan's lies. Or you might think, well, that's a negative way of putting it. And why do we always have to bring Satan into it? Well, I do because, to me, the history of salvation, the history of our world, even each of our own little individual lives just doesn't make sense unless we understand that we are caught up in a great, terrible war. The war is between Christ and Satan, and the war is over the character and government of God. The war is over what kind of person God is, that's his character, and how he runs his universe, that's his government. And they're kind of the same thing because he is love, that's the kind of person he is, and he runs his universe on the principle of love. So it all harmonizes very well. In this war, Satan's weapon is lies, and he has been spreading terrible lies about the character and government of God that cause people to fear God and to rebel against God and hate him. I'm sure you've heard some of these lies. One of them goes, if you love, you lose. It's survival of the fittest in God's universe. Or there's this lie. God made the Sabbath to test you to see how miserable you are willing to be for his sake. He's wake, watching to see if you'll break a Sabbath rule. Or this lie. If you're sick, it's because God is punishing you. Every day, Jesus had a work to do in breaking Satan's lies by showing what God is really like, by revealing the Father. And from day to day, the specific tasks would vary, and Jesus, Jesus would listen for instructions about where to go and what to do. One day he would go to a wedding, another day he might preach, another day teach or tell stories or heal sick people. That was often on his to-do list, healing he would know exactly what to do each day because of his connection with God the Father. He said as much when he was brought before the Sanhedrin. It's in John 5, 19. I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Jesus and the Father were like this. They were in constant communion. And remember, Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit rested on Jesus at his baptism. So you could say that Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit were like this. Jesus always had the counsel of the Holy Spirit, always had the guidance of the Father. And that's my second reason for believing that Jesus never wrote out a to-do list. He didn't need one. He never lost focus. He never was in doubt about the right thing to do for God's kingdom. 
I'll tell you my third reason in just a moment. But first, I'd like to focus on just one day, the day of our story. It was a Sabbath. If Jesus had had a to-do list for that Sabbath, I think it would have included these specific items. Break down Satan's lies about survival of the fittest. Break Satan's lie about Sabbath rules and restrictions. And break Satan's lie about God punishing people with sickness. And Jesus might have accomplished even more than what's on this to-do list that I've made up for him for that Sabbath day. Listen to what John wrote in John 21, 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for books that would be written. And that's the third reason I think Jesus never wrote out a to-do list. There wouldn't have been room for them. It's kind of a poetic reason, I guess. <laughs> so Jesus was in Jerusalem um, for a major feast and without a to-do list in his pocket, but with a clear purpose in his head, he went to the pool of Bethesda, which is near the Sheep Gate. And what a pitiful scene he saw there. It was sort of like a scene we might see around a swimming pool on a sunny day, you know, when people are lying around the deck. But there was a big difference. The people who were lying around the edge of the pool were not getting a tan or reading a book or chatting or sipping iced drinks. No, these people were moaning. They were lame and blind and sick and suffering and just miserable. They were in terrible shape. And the worst case of all was a man whose name we do not know, so we call him the paralytic at the Pool of Bethesda. He had no one to help him. Someone had taken pity on him and carried him to the pool, but then he had been left alone. And I wonder where his family was. You know, sometimes people make choices in their life and they kind of burn bridges and there's estrangement, or I don't know, but he didn't have family to help him. So how did he get food? Was he hungry? Was he thirsty? Who was there to help him to the bathroom? And what about bed sores? You know, when a patient can't move, it's very important that he be turned and massaged because his circulation isn't good. And if his skin isn't tended to, you know, with massage, then he'll get terrible ulcers called bed sores. So this guy was in terrible shape and there was no one to help him. In addition to all the physical suffering, there was the pain of guilt that he felt. Causes have their effects and it was largely owing to this man's own disorderly behavior that he had gotten sick in the first place. And so a lot of people thought that his sickness was a judgment, a punishment imposed on him by God. No wonder he was so miserable. It's, it's bad enough to be sick. But if on top of that, you believe that God made you sick because you had it coming, well, that's, that's even worse. Jesus' heart ached to see this man and all the other sufferers. He was the great physician and he had the power to heal them all. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to heal all of them. But he knew that if he did that, the Pharisees would be so upset with him that his ministry would come to an end then and there. And it wasn't that he was afraid of being executed. No, no. Ever since he was 12 years old, Jesus had known that he was the Lamb of God and that one day, someday, on his to-do list, so to speak, there would be the item endure, torture, and execution. Someday that 
would be the way he would reveal the Father. That would be the way he would break Satan's lies. But that day wasn't this day. This was not the day for that item. So Jesus could not heal all the people, but he could heal one. Which one would he choose? This is important. This is really important because in his choice, Jesus revealed the Father and broke one of Satan's lies. You see, it was believed that an angel came from God and stirred the waters of the pool of Bethesda just every once in a while. And they believed that the first person who managed to get into the pool after the waters rippled or bubbled would be healed. And only that person would be healed. Now, it was true that the waters did sometimes ripple. Um, this was because the pool was fed by an inter intermittent spring. That part was true. But what a stinking lie to make up about God, that he would be pleased to see his suffering children competing with each other for his healing. Remember what Jesus said in his parable about the wheat and the tares. It's in Matthew 13, 24 to 30. And in that parable, Jesus said, An enemy has done this. Yes, an enemy has done this. It's true that the principle of the survival of the fittest is at work in our world, kind of the way it was at the Pool of Bethesda. It's true that it was the strongest and fittest people who managed to get into the water first, but it wasn't God who ordained that, either at the Pool of Bethesda or in our world. So when you see the principle of survival of the fittest at work in nature or in hu human society, remember that it wasn't God who ordained it. An enemy, our enemy Satan, put that principle in motion. Remember what Jesus taught. He said that the way the Father runs his universe is on the principle of self-sacrificing love. It's in Matthew 20, 26. Whoever would be great among you, let him be your servant. That is the opposite of survival of the fittest. Those were Jesus' words. Whoever would be great among you, let him be your servant. And he proved his words by his action. All through his life and in his death, he was the majesty of heaven. But he was the servant of all. And that day at the pool of Bethesda, he chose not the fittest, but the most unfit of all the sufferers. In the kingdom of our God, it's not survival of the fittest. In the kingdom of our God, the fittest serves the most unfit. So imagine this poor paralyzed man, the most unfit person in all that miserable gathering. He's lying flat on his back, staring up at the sky, no hope at all. And maybe what's going through his mind on a continuous loop is one of Satan's lies. Maybe he's thinking, God made me sick to punish me because I broke his law. God made me sick to punish me because I broke his law. And then that continuous loop is interrupted because someone has crouched down next to him and this man is looking up into the kindest face he had ever seen. Jesus asks, do you want to be well? And the man started to explain about how he could never get to the water first because, you know, he had no one to help him. But Jesus didn't bother with all that superstitious nonsense. He said, get up, pick up your bed and walk. And the sick man just simply believed and obeyed Jesus. His nerves came back to life. His atrophied muscles were strong and toned again. His bones, which had become porous and weak because of bearing no weight for 38 years, 
instantly had the proper bone density and his circulation was restored. And if he had had any bed sores, those were immediately and completely healed. What a wonder, what a joy. The crowd at the pool of Bethesda must have been amazed. And Jesus slipped away. The man went off carrying his bed. Here's a painting I'd like you to see. Have you seen this one before? It's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, but it's not on display there right now. So we are permitted to look at a digital version of it and I'm really glad we are. Um, it's by a Flemish painter named Jan Sanders van Hemmesen, who painted it back in the 1500s. There's the healed paralytic wearing a robe. It's sort of a Bible style long robe, but it's pure white and clean. That symbolizes the man's healing. I, I don't think that the men of Jesus time actually wore robes that were slit up to the mid thigh like that, but Van Hemmesen wanted to show what strong, healthy leg muscles Jesus had given the paralytic. So we allow him some artistic license to slit that robe and show those good muscles. Then over the robe, the man is wearing a European style doublet. That red doublet kind of looks like something that Sir Walter Raleigh or Shakespeare would have worn. And that just pleases me. It shows me that Van Hemmesen liked to put details from his own time and place into this Bible picture. Look very carefully uh, at the background in the left. Can you see there a little detail? There's a building that the style of architecture looks European to me. There are four men, see the tiny four men on the roof. They have cut a very neat hole um, up in the roof and they have lowered through the roof a man. He's down on the ground you can still see ropes tied to the corners of his basket, he, blanket. He's lying there and you can see Jesus speaking to him. And you might think, whoa, whoa, that's the wrong story. Uh, that, that was the other paralytic who was let down through the roof in Capernaum. This painter must have gotten his stories mixed up. But no, Van Hemmesen didn't get his stories mixed up. The reason he put that little detail in the back was he wanted to tell us Jesus not only healed the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, he also healed the man in Capernaum who was lowered down through the roof. That's the sort of healer Jesus is. Oh, now let's look at what is the biggest feature, I think, of the painting, and that is the bed that the man is carrying. It looks like a great big old feather bed, or maybe it's a straw mattress. Anyway, the man is bent over under the bulk of this huge thing. And we know that that probably was not, was definitely not the kind of bed that the man at the Pool of Bethesda had. He, he probably had something more like just a little mat or a sleeping bag that he could easily roll up and tuck under one arm. But Van Hemmesen, well, first of all, I think that a skilled painter would just have fun painting billows and poofs of fabric like that. So we allow him poetic, I mean, artistic license to do that. But I think also he painted that bed big because he wanted us to know that the carrying of the bed was an important part of the story. I don't know, maybe someday I will get to meet Van Hemmesen. And if I do, I want to tell him, thank you for that painting you painted back in the 1500s, because I got to see it in the 21st century and it gave me pleasure and it made me think about the story, the two stories of the healings of the paralytics by our Lord. So I hope I get to meet him and tell him, thank you. Anyway. Back to this great big bed, or this bed that uh, attracted a lot of attention. Actually, 
a man with a rolled up mat under his arm would not have attracted attention as he walked through the streets of Jerusalem, except that it was a Sabbath. And the religious leaders scolded the man. They said, you've broken the law. Yes, they really considered the carrying of a light burden like that as Sabbath breaking. And they had lots of fussy rules like that. Eventually, the paralytic was able to tell them, and I'm, I'm sure he told them joyfully, that's the man who healed me, Jesus. And he didn't realize that um, he got Jesus into trouble in that way <laughs> because Jesus was hailed into court and accused of Sabbath breaking and blasphemy. And all the rest of chapter five of John is about how Jesus defended himself against the accusations of the religious leaders. And that is worth a whole nother sermon on its own. You ought to read that part too. It's compelling stuff. So Jesus was in trouble with the religious leaders because he held that the Sabbath was for healing, not for piling on fussy, onerous rules. And he was in trouble because he said that he was the son of God, equal with God, doing the works of God. If people wanted to know what God thought of the survival of the fittest, if people wanted to know what God thought of burdensome restrictions about Sabbath keeping, if people wanted to know what God thought of sinners who got themselves into messes and were suffering and needed healing, then all they had to do was pay attention to Jesus, for Jesus was and is very God, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, and blessed forever. Amen. The religious leaders were privileged to have God standing before them in human flesh, and they hated him, and they were determined to kill him. Do you think Jesus said, Oops, I never saw that coming. If I had known there would be such a kerfuffle about healing this man, I wouldn't have healed him on the Sabbath, or at least I wouldn't have told him to carry his bed to attract all that attention. No, no, Jesus said nothing like that. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he knew what the consequences would be. Jesus very intentionally healed the paralytic on the Sabbath and told him to carry his mat in order to make a public statement about the Sabbath, that it should be not a burden, all weighed down with meaningless rules and exactions, but a blessing and a delight, a day of healing, a day to celebrate the good character of God. Of all the Ten Commandments, the one which Jesus worked hardest to clarify and lift up was the Sabbath commandment. Now, why would that be? Because the Sabbath celebrates the character of God. And it is the character of God that is the issue in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Every Sabbath reminds us that God is our generous, beauty-loving, freedom-loving creator. Every Sabbath reminds us that God is the one who frees us from bondage to slavery, to sin, just as he freed the Israelites from bondage to slavery in Egypt. Every Sabbath is a sign between God and us that we really are his people who belong to him, and he is the one who changes us and makes us holy. He sanctifies us, not by means of our striving, but by our resting in him and trusting in him. And Jesus would soon add even more meaning to the Sabbath when having finished his work of redemption, he would rest in a borrowed tomb over the Sabbath. You know, kind of like when he had finished his work of creation, he, he made a day of rest. Every Sabbath also, besides pointing us back to Calvary, points us forward to the second coming because every Sabbath reminds us that there remains a Sabbath-like rest for the people of God. That's in Hebrews, you know. 
No wonder that Satan has attacked the Sabbath so doggedly. The Sabbath says so much about the kind of person God is. So Satan attacks the Sabbath. Sometimes he attacks by getting people to forget it completely. Sometimes he attacks by burdening the Sabbath with needless exactions. And sometimes Satan attacks the Sabbath by drawing a darkness over the rich meaning of the Sabbath. No wonder Jesus worked so hard to defend the Sabbath and to fulfill the law by filling the Sabbath full of me meaning. This miracle at the Pool of Bethesda was just the first of seven miraculous healings that Jesus performed on Sabbath days. Well, actually, there might have been more than seven, but um, these seven were recorded. Can you see them here? These are the seven miracles of healing that Jesus worked on Sabbaths. First, the invalid at the Pool of Bethesda. That's our story for today. And then in Capernaum, he healed a demoniac in the synagogue. And then he went home from services that very same Sabbath day and healed Peter's mother-in-law. Later on, he healed the man with a withered hand. And that also happened in the synagogue, a synagogue. It was a different synagogue. Um, then he healed the man born blind. That happened in Jerusalem. And he healed the crippled woman in the synagogue up north in Perea and the man with dropsy. That was probably also in Perea. Seven cases. And you see, I've, I've written the gospel texts there. And some of them are recorded in two or three gospels. But of these seven cases, only one was acute. Only one was an emergency. And that was Peter's mother-in-law. She had a high fever. But the rest of the people had chronic ailments that had been going on for months or weeks or years or decades. <laughs> and so Jesus could have healed six of those seven the day before Sabbath or the day after Sabbath. But no, he very intentionally healed these people on the Sabbath because he wanted to show that the Sabbath is about healing, physical healing and spiritual healing. And here's where I'd like to compare the, the two paralytics, you know, the one that we saw as the main feature of the painting and then the, the, the little one that was tucked into the background as a detail. The paralytic at the Pool of Bethesda first received spirit, uh, physical healing. And then later on, Jesus found him in the temple and talked to him about his sin and offered him spiritual healing. With the paralytic who was let down through the roof, it was just the opposite. First, Jesus healed him spiritually. Remember, he said, my son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And, oh, that was what the man wanted most. And then he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. So both men received from Jesus both physical healing and spiritual healing, even though he treated them differently. He treated them differently because they were different individuals and he knew and understand and sympathized with their differing needs. But both of them were made whole because Jesus cares about the whole person. Jesus cares about the whole person who is you. He's right beside you and healing is in his hands. He asks you, wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to get well? You and I of ourselves can no more live healthy, holy lives than the paralytic could by himself get up and walk. Maybe we have sick that patterns of thought or sick patterns of behavior that have paralyzed us for years. Maybe we have believed Satan's lies. You know, the lie that says it's survival of the fittest in God's world. It's a dog eat dog world and you'd better watch out for yourself. Take care of yourself first. Or maybe you've believed the lie that goes, the purpose of the Sabbath commandment is to make life miserable for you. Or maybe you've believed the lie that says, 
if you're sick, it's because God is punishing you for your sin. On that Sabbath at the Pool of Bethesda, Jesus broke all three of those lies. If Jesus had had a to-do list, I think he could have put a check in the box next to each one of those lies as utterly refuted, or as my, my friends in England say, done and dusted. <laughs> so I don't think we should ever believe any of those lies again. I think what we should do is believe what Jesus revealed to us about the Father. My little sister Mary Lou says that the more she believes that God loves her, the easier it is for her to think right and do right. That's so simple, isn't it? It's as simple as getting up, rolling up your mat, and walking. So let's be believe Jesus and and walk in newness of life, starting today, and then starting tomorrow, and then starting again the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. And then when Sabbath comes, we will have so much to celebrate. We will fill the Sabbath day with celebration because we'll have more and more reasons to adore our creator and our healer. And I suppose that all the Sabbaths we have left in our lives won't be too many to do that. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, dear Son, dear Holy Spirit, we thank you for this Sabbath story. Oh, Jesus, you surely did burst the lies of Satan in this story. Help us to trust you. Help us to um, entrust to you our to-do lists so that we're staying in touch with you and always doing the next right thing for your kingdom. And help us especially when Sabbath comes to celebrate and contemplate your glorious goodness. All the angels in heaven love to praise you and we ask that you accept our praise too. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>